How's your your lockdown been, man? You, I forget you have um one or two kids. I've got I've got a little girl, just one. Yeah, she's like just turned one. So yeah, it's been How's good. Been? Yeah, man, it's been good. It's been uh, it's been nice to spend time with the family and stuff. Um, you know, it has its like pros and cons of like. Yeah. Going your, like, your, um, does your wife have like a normal job? At least you know she uh, a normal yeah, person in that way. Like, yeah, she, uh, she, she was on because she's only one. She was on maternity leave till like oh, right. uh, like literally, technically <clears throat> went back to work in like February. So, yeah. so she hasn't actually even been back. So, um, but luckily, kind of technically started back. So then they were like paying her, and then they had to like carry on paying her while they while she wasn't working and that kind of thing. So right, it, kind right. of, it somehow all managed to work out, like timed itself quite well. Yeah, I mean, I think that, because the people that I know that have kids where even if one of the parents has a real job, it's just like, you know, <laughs> being trapped in an apartment with a two-year-old or four-year-old, whatever it is, has been really challenging to kind of get, get it done. And then my buddy is a designer in London and his wife has a real job. And he's freelance, and so he's become in charge of their two-year-old son. And it's like, yeah. you know, his full-time experience now is being a caretaker of this kid. Yeah. And so, he, you know, he had a big bad. life of, like, doing these cool jobs, and now he's just that, and it's tough, you know. So, I, I, you know, we don't have kids, and so I've, as much as I've complained, which I do plenty of, I try to be grateful that there's not, like, a toddler, you know, <laughs> bothering me to go play while I'm trying no. to worry about my career, you know. Um, <laughs> She's like, it's been quite nice because I, I was on – I had like two away jobs almost back to back just before it all started. So yeah. I wasn't really there. And my wife, she was like just starting to crawl. And so my wife was like sending me videos and stuff while I was away. And then now from like that, like not even being able to crawl to like now she's like walking around on her own. So having like two months to see her do that is, has been really nice. You know, I might have been completely yeah. able to see her first step. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that's the thing, I guess. Um, because probably pre-lockdown, you would have been, I'm sure, like I would be worried about missing that time because we travel a lot for work. It's all over the place. You never know when you're going to be there. And everyone's like, oh, the first year you got to be around, you know. And so I've I've been worried about that since I was a kid, virtually about being being away for like for work because you never know what you'll be drawn to. So what were the um, the two last jobs you did? Are they are they out yet? Are they coming out or what's their? No, no, yeah, they're, they're, they're not out yet. No. So one was in Brazil. We went down okay. to Port Alegre um and it was for like toyota and the paralympics so okay. i don't really know what they're actually going to do with it in in the end now because obviously i don't you know i don't know what's going to happen with all the olympics and that kind of thing yeah so. i guess it gets shelved till next year maybe right yeah wow. i mean I, I i had done an olympic spot for asics and then they just kind of repurposed it i think they sort of it became more of like the classic training bullshit thing. It just wasn't, they didn't really mention the Olympics. It kind of just folded it into like an anthem kind right. of thing, but yeah, yeah. it was terrible. It was pretty bad, but, <laughs> but, uh, uh you yeah. know, they put it out and just sort of didn't mention any of the, the nationalism or something, but yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that's good. It's good that you got it. I was curious because I feel like we're maybe at the last point of like stuff that was shot before lockdown coming out now kind of thing, which is a weird place to be where it's like, yeah. You know, people are releasing projects that were feel like they're 100 years ago now. I mean, there's I have one that I shot in January that hopefully will come out soon, the director's cut. And it's like to think about that production only a few months ago. And now it's like this bizarro world of like the experience of that shoot and now this yeah. life. And so it's very strange. But, um, you know, and I'm sure initially there's people that didn't want to put work out because like the films that are being you know released next year now because they don't want to actually you yeah, know, yeah. worry about the, the reception of it um the insensitivity of it a lot of guys that have been working on features and stuff you know that were done already and but they're still getting completely pushed back to like next year or, or christmas or something and yeah i think people are starting to slowly run out of work and also over here i don't know what it's been like in in the states but they've been doing a lot of like you know, remote shooting, kind of Zoom commercials. All yeah, I mean, guys. Um, we, there's a director duo that I worked with last year on a spot. Um, they were great guys and they, uh, they were the first and only ones to reach out for that kind of thing. It didn't work out, you know, because the problem is, is maybe his experience too. You're privy to only the people in your household. And so, you know, I have a very nice home. It looks really photographic and beautiful, but I have my wife and my cat <laughs> <laughs> and so if they don't, you know, they're basically choosing the cinematographer based on that, 
not based on your work anymore. So it's a weird like backwards right. thing. And so I sort of, I had to submit like a PDF of all my corners of my house and my wife standing in and like a photo board kind of way. Yeah. And uh, they ended up pivoting. It was for a big telecom brand. So they ended up, the creative pivoted towards more like businessy, like big business stuff. And so we weren't chosen, but they made the spot with 20 cities across the world. These directors, you know, curated these little shoots from afar. Yeah. Um, it so, was, a, it was you know, a Heineken one that was floating around the UK. And I'm pretty sure that every DP I spoke to, like, worked on it at some point. <laughs> one of, or no, kind of read the treatment. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, it yeah. out to like every single, it was like, it was quite near the beginning of the lockdown. And everyone was yeah. like, this kind of job came out and they wanted to shoot it properly on, you know, on Alexa's or whatever. Or yeah. You have their own kit. But again, like, it came, like, they made us, like, me and my wife actually ended up doing like a little, audition of like one of the scenes and recorded yep. it on my phone there you go oh, yeah. And, yeah and then you think you're thinking to yourself like oh man i have to like win an oscar to now start shooting like these these yeah i mean spots. think about it it's the most it's already such a crowded world to be in you know these markets like we are like it's one of the most competitive jobs you know in art and then you add in that no one else is working and yeah. so now it's literally it's everyone pulled against each other it's madness but i also felt like as a consumer and as a viewer, I got even the first like week, I was so tired of I'm already experiencing this thing. And now all the commercials and art are reflecting that. And I felt yeah. like I don't want to be living in it also on television or also online. Like, I don't want to just just be something creative and different. So just be a normal commercial or be a normal something else. I felt like I don't need to be to double edged sword of like I'm already in this terrible position in my actual life. And now yeah. I'm having to witness it via my commercials. Yeah. Just make it, you know, just garbage. Make it something else. Like just yeah, nothing yeah. related. Yeah, well, every so I think I what's think that's interesting, the one piece I have that's, or I should have like two-ish, but one, the one piece that's coming out is like by no means related to, it's, it's about, it's sort of like almost like sci-fi weird stuff. It's like fully different. So I feel like, you know, for me, I'm looking forward to that just because it is so you know, uh, everyone's going this way, I'm going this way kind of thing. I feel yeah, you know, excited about it being so so far removed from the work that we've seen, you know, the last two months. So um, we'll see. You know, it's it's challenging. I, I don't know how you operate on your, you know, pre-lockdown, like how you operate on your days off, what your usual routine is and your rhythms of it. But for me, like, and maybe we talked about this when we first met, I've always looked at it sort of like a sport where I feel like I want to be in, a, in the gym of, of film and cinematography, I want to be lifting those weights on my off days like you would an athlete that's training, you know, kind of thing. Because I feel like the frustrating part about film is that you can't do it alone for the most part. And so yeah. I always was initially when I first joined the business frustrated that like you'd have all this time between jobs. You know, back then I was barely working probably. So I felt like, what can I do? How can I stay fresh and strong in this medium? And so I, you know, I have my sort of rhythms of watching films, film theory, essays and reading things and just, just basically trying to pump your brain full of that stuff, you know, like a business day, like you would like a nine to five. I try to behave that way uh, Monday through Friday on my off days. And so when I was tasked initially with this lockdown of like, well, now every day is that day, you know, it's it's been ups and downs, but I feel like I haven't gotten a rhythm of watching a film a day, which is something I've always done on my off days period. Um, you know, and I try to just stew in that stuff for a bit longer, maybe, um, and sort of, I think something that I lacked in maybe I like, I've always been a cinephile. I've watched a lot of films. I went to film school. I've been in it for a long time, but I felt like I'd maybe because of the success of my own career, you know, by working a lot and sort of being ca caught up in the rhythms of that neglected more of the sort of art theory and sort of contemplation kind of that I sort of have a love hate relationship with to begin with. I feel like sometimes it's kind of horseshit and I feel like people in film and in all art, you know, can really kind of stretch things and just manipulate it into their own ideas when you, yeah. the filmmaker might say something totally different. But I feel like I've tried in this lockdown to, to try to think that way, to think a bit more th theoretically after seeing a film about zoom out in my brain about what the film is and the techniques and symbolism and all the things that normally I might just look past. Yeah. And so, you know, that's been a lot of it. Um, you know, I did do some drawing, which is something I did a lot as a kid. I drew a lot and it's something I have not done honestly since film school, probably when I used to do my own storyboards. Um, so, you know, I think the frustration for me is that like, I also played music growing up a little bit. And so I had, 
um, initially thought, okay, I'm going to be an artist again. I'm going to be doing music. I'm going to be doing all these things. But I got hit with the fact that I'm I'm really a novice in those things. I don't know what I'm doing yeah. really anymore. And so here's this thing in film in which I'm really experiencing. I've given my life to, and then music and art. I was kind of like, well, I'm kind of a chump in these worlds. I'm not really, <laughs> I'm not really very good. And so I think there was initially a frustration for me, you know, the first few weeks of this of being like, well, I'm a nobody, I'm nothing in this. I can barely do anything cool, but in film, at least I know what I'm doing. So it's been a balance, but, um, yeah, but I think for the most part, the effort's been just to, uh, have those film muscles come out of this stronger than they ever were. Cause again, that concentration, I've never had that, that much, you know, but I think I'm sure the case is for you as well. And most of us is that you can only do so much that way. I ultimately, you have to be on set making choices and making images yeah. yourself. It's really, you know, it is, um, kind of make believe until you're actually there doing it. You can dream up all the lighting plots and all the ideas about what it's going to look like. And then you get there and it looks like shit. It's like, well, okay, <laughs> what did you really accomplish and learn? So I think, um, you know, that's not lost on me. I, that's something I'm very much aware of in this is that it doesn't really, it's still not really moving the same way that I would be if I was on sets for the last two months, you know, kind of thing. So but I think but, it's definitely a good, um, a good way to keep your mind, do you know what I mean? Active and thinking. And I mean, when yeah. you say you, 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 when art, you know, you say you watch a film and then do you actually like write stuff down and like, you know, and actually kind of almost do like a little kind of, no, I mean, I think or if I just if take I a moment, it, I, I always do it yourself. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think about it myself quite a bit. I'll, I'll always try to find interviews with the director, interviews yeah. with the DP. I'm a big interview guy, as I'm sure many people are, you know. And now, of course, you know, there's so many more resources for that now. There's so many film podcasts that I never knew about, and they're all on Spotify or, you know, A24 and DGA and all these sources now that have these really good talks with directors that I really admire. And so, that's probably the best thing if you can if you can find those sources because you're going right to the source. You literally here's you watch a film yeah. without knowing these insider things, and now you're hearing a, an interview with the director about that movie, and they may uncover things that you were like, oh, they were doing that or they weren't doing that. I think as and well, so that's I think been a really a lot of the like. I, I think the the restrictions have become a lot less. Like I mean, I can remember being like you know a lot younger and watching like maybe director's commentary or maybe just like the odd interview on TV with like a director and they seemed like, you know, they probably had their PR person stood to the side telling them what not to say. But I mean, you listen yeah. to something like the, you know, the Uncut Gems podcast on the age sure. and it's yeah. like, they, you know, those guys were just like, they were just talking about whatever they wanted. You know, they were like saying all these yeah. different yeah. things that happened on set, you know, giving all those kind of crazy anecdotes. And that's like, those are like the cool yeah. things you want to hear about. Do you know but what I mean? It's, it's funny you should mention those guys because we have some mutual friends in New York. I, I haven't met them personally, but I, my buddy Chris is part of that fabric of guys that they all share an office in Lower East Side and a lot of them have gone on to do great things. But I watched, um, I've seen their films and then I watched a Criterion Collection does this closet picks thing. Have you seen this? They do like a YouTube channel where they go into this closet okay. at Criterion and filmmakers people they invite in will sort of go through they pick out movies and suggest and be like, oh this one's great you got to see this and so i'd seen early and maybe even pre-lockdown i'd seen a video of the safety brothers doing that i didn't know a single film they'd seen they were referencing really esoteric unusual things and like b-side just really bizarre stuff and i was like man you know if i'm ever going to want to hang if i had an interview with them and a couple you never know these are things yeah, yeah. that could happen in my mind, at least they, they could happen. I need to be able to hang, you know, with these kind of filmmakers. So I watched a bunch of them. There were other people that I admired in this, you know, catalog of, uh, of Criterion uh, videos. And I was like, all right, I got to step my game up. I got to really kind of go cast a wider net and go a bit deeper. Because I think that for me, like, I, I mean, I certainly do love unusual foreign films. I like some sort of hidden crate stuff. But as a whole, my taste does lean a bit more grandiose and a little bit more like I love big sci-fi. I love, you know, the films of the 80s and 90s that we grew up with. You know, Fincher, someone is really important to me. You know, these are all kind of known yeah. names. And I didn't really make an effort the last five or six years to really dig deeper into sort of some of the more underbelly of film. And, um, you know, part of that was from working a lot and just kind of you're worrying yeah. about that and not worrying about, you know, digging through the crates and finding weird shit kind of thing. But I think that, again, it's something that with this year, 
trying to make more of an effort to cast a wider net and get a bit weirder and a bit thing, if for nothing else, to learn what I don't like. But then also, you know, you never know to, to be ready in case a director yeah. drops some fucking really unusual director in an uh, interview. And you're like, oh, yeah, I've seen their whole on we, you know, whatever it is. Like, I think you want to be part of that. So uh, it's, again, that sort of uh, the gym. I want to be I want to be working out in that world and to be muscular, you know. Um, I, think, I think there's definitely like a in the definitely in the film industry, there is like such a shame cast upon like the guilty pleasures of like films sure. films like i mean i have some like awful awful guilty pleasures like that i i've i've watched and thought you know it's not a good film but you know i i like watching it's it like, important to you yeah, yeah yeah i mean i watched what happens in vegas and i didn't i didn't hate it i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah i no, mean it's, it's weird the one like, thing that- there's so such a you, snobbery you, with something like, that you film saw. Industry, like what films you've watched kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. But is that one in particular that you saw, like when it came out, you were in a place in your life where like it spoke to, you know, where is it like, oh, I was in my college dorm room with buddies when I first saw that. Because that oh, is part yeah, of the, yeah. the film. I mean, that's the cool part, right, is that, you know, if it's important to you, you can probably remember where you first saw it, where you were, you know, who you're with maybe. And so it is that kind of time capsule moment which is unlike many other mediums. So I think that that's the cool part about, I mean, even the dumbest movie, but I watched, you know, Can't Hardly Wait. It was a film that I grew up with. My wife and I are both fans of that movie. I went to a friend's house yeah. uh, and we watched uh, on a, a, like an outdoor screen. They had like a big outdoor kind of screen thing. And I could quote, I haven't you know seen it in years and I, could, I knew all the words, yeah, yeah. you know, we're like quoting left and right. And so that's something that is not technically a good film, People yeah. aren't like discussing the depth of can't hardly wait, but <laughs> it was important to me at a time and place in my life. And so I'll always carry that with me. And so I think that that's the cool part about it, you know, yeah. that, but I think that there should be no shame in that. That's for sure. No, no, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you, you, you live in New York now. Yeah. Did you, did yeah, you I mean, I'm in New York. I grew up in Philadelphia, um, which is pretty close. Yeah. Um, you know, spiritually and physically. Um, and then I came here in 2004. So it's been quite a long time, which is kind of when I think about it, it's like, man, that's a whole different world ago. But um, but yeah, I came here for film school. I mean, I, I was sort of, you know, fresh eyed kid from Philly that wanted to make movies. And uh, my sister was in the same school for photography, um, the School of Visual Arts. And she was doing well. She really had enjoyed her time in New York. And I came to visit uh, when I was in high school and I, I sort of saw a side of New York that I hadn't seen before. You know, I think that there's the New York that as a visitor you come and see, which is very different, of course, than what's actually like to be here. Um, and so when I came with her and saw what it's actually like, I, I really fell in love. And then you know, here we are 16 years later. So, um, so yeah, it's it's been a great home. Yeah, I really love it here. And uh, so before you went to uni, before you, um, you know, went to visit your sister and stuff, did you have like a interest in filmmaking has it always been something that you've been interested in yeah i mean i i grew up my i'm lucky my, my parents are both big film buffs um and part of sort of the fabric of our family was just seeing films and talking about it, it was kind of a fun family yeah. event you know we go to the movies um my dad was a production designer that worked on commercials when i was a kid in philadelphia um and so, you know, he grew up an artist and a film buff himself and then was working on sets to this, you know, small level. My mom was a copywriter, writing commercials. And so, you know, they both were very much, you know, uh, invested in film and art and all those kind of things. So my sister and I grew up pretty lucky that way and that we, you know, that was just part of the fabric of the family was, you know, watching stuff and talking about it. So, you know, that was it wasn't really until high school that I got serious about film. Um, you know, that was sort of the birth of uh, DV cameras and being able to edit at home. And so, you know, I had, uh, a camera that I got for Christmas when I was, I think 14 or 15. And so I could sort of finally ingest those files and start cutting them and making little movies and skate films. And, you know, I think a lot of us that age, you know, maybe the same for you, you know, became, that kind of became our spark into making it ourselves. And, um, I took a, I was lucky. I took a film course, like a Saturday sort of pre-college course at a local art school in Philly um, with a buddy of mine. And it was like, you know, directing 101 or like film 101 yeah, kind yeah. of thing. It's like a four hour Saturday thing. And um, the first thing we did, the very first class was, 
it was the opening of the godfather and the guy started basically breaking down the entire film <laughs> and i was just like i had never you know as much as as a 14 year old you might think you know about everything i had never thought about any of the stuff that he was talking the nuts and bolts of the choices made the composition everything about it i was like wow this is a whole art form that i never knew existed and so i it really was the spark for everything i think I, yeah i must have been a sophomore in high school so yeah that's, that was, uh, yeah, it was 17, 18 years ago. So, um, so yeah, that was kind of it. And I, I really, I was kind of the person that, I don't know about you, but I was kind of that guy that always wanted to choose what you're going to be and stick to it kind of thing. Like I, when I was a kid, I really wanted to be an athlete like most people. And so I was like, I'm going to be in the, in the NBA. I was tall. I played basketball. I was like, that's my thing. I'm going to be work as hard as I can at this. And then yeah. you realize you're just a tall white guy and you're not very good. And no one cares. <laughs> And I got dunked on all of high school and it was miserable. But, you know, with film, when I found that, I thought, OK, I'm going to this is this is my thing now. I'm going to donate my life to this and I'll try and get ahead. and I'll work as hard as I can in this medium. And that's really what I did. So I went to film school wanting to be a DP. I, I thought that it would be I thought everyone would want to be a director. And so I thought I'll be the next guy down. I'll, I'll that'll be my angle. My, yeah. You know, I'll be sort of the curveball guy. I'll be like well, you're all doing this. I'm going to go ahead and be this guy. It's a bit different. And so uh, funnily enough, the first day of film school, you know, they went around the room and everyone's like, hey, I'm Garrett from Philly. You're supposed to say sort of what you want to do in film. And I was like the second guy to go out of the class. And I said, oh, you know, I want to be a DP. And then I thought everyone else would just say, oh, I want to be a writer or director. And then literally two thirds of the class after me said, oh, yeah, I also want to be a DP. And I thought, <laughs> OK, well, now, like, OK, this this quote unquote special thing I thought I owned is now actually it's realizing that I'm not alone in that. But, you know, I think um, it was good to have that early on that that sort of decision and to lean into something that way. I think that I was lucky not everyone, you know, in art, especially finds their calling early. I think I know a lot of people that are directors that were once illustrators or graphic designers and then fumbled into being a photographer. You know, a lot of people have that kind of serpentine, you know, yeah. elevation, but for me, I'm kind of a lifer. I, I really, you know, have been focused on this for as long as I can remember. So there's, to me, there's like the negative side of that is, well, maybe you should be further along. You know, there's the, the sort of pressure on yourself to be like, well, if you knew about this since you were 15, you should be fucking the star of the show. Yeah, but yeah. then it's also like, that's not how it works. So, you know, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's very much a life's calling and it's been a great journey, but um, how about you? I mean, I, I, I'm definitely with you there, man. I, I can remember being like, like 12, like, you know, mm -hmm. 12, 11 with my, I had like a video, a VHS video camera that my granddad gave me and it had, and we would make like, you know, really janky stop start animation videos or like just filming me and my friends just messing around. And then that evolved into skateboarding and I was never the best skateboarder out of the crew. So like you said, I, I, you know, like you said, I thought, right, well, what can I do that's different? And I already had this kind of want to, you know, make films. So I started being like the filmer. And thankfully that yeah. kind of kept me in the crew, not being the yeah, best yeah. skateboarder, but I could make the videos. And thankfully, yeah, I think it, it was like a massive blessing for me that I knew from like, you know, like the age of like 13, 14, you know, where I wanted to end up eventually. So I think yeah. that, and I, I think that definitely gives you drive as well. You know, it gets you through those yeah. points and to, to that place. Yeah. Do you feel like if you were to go back to that kid now, if you you know, we would time tra time travel back to him, would he be happy with what he's seeing? Like, would he be stoked that you are where you are, and yeah, I mean, you know that, it's that you're doing it? Kind of it's, it's, it's like a lot of the aspects are very different, but I think they, you know, I think I. I think I'm quite happy where I've got to, you know what I mean? And comfortable yeah. with what I'm doing at the moment. And there's obviously, there's obviously always, you know, that classic, yeah. like, Conaghy, you know, your, yourself in 10 years time is your hero. Do you know what I mean? And like, I'm always striving to push further and do it more. But I think, I think where I've got to at the moment, I'm, you know, very, yeah. very happy with. Cause that's something that I try, you know, um, as someone who's really driven and competitive and all these kind of things that can be lean negative, 
I do try to think about even on a shorter scale, you know, this time last year, like to yeah. get from a yearly chunk kind of thing to ref, to use that as a reflection back on how well you're doing. And, you know, it's a, I think it's a really positive thing I've, I've tried to do is, you know, to go back to 15 year old me or 25 year old me or whomever and try to think about, well, would he be really happy with what you're doing? And he would be. So that's sort of a good measuring stick, I think, no, you know, for your I, own journey, try to do it that way. Um, you, it helps, I think. Did you, so uh, when you finished um, the uni and, uh, you know, the film course, did you come straight out as a, you know, and call yourself a DP and that was it? You were going straight off to shooting or did you, did you crew at all? Or? I did. Yeah, I crewed. Yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know, you know, I, when I graduated film school, it was the first year of the red. And yeah. that sort of, to me, was a big markation of like when the kind of owner operator, like the game kind of changed for a lot of people because, Massively. you know, for people that are younger than me, like before that, it was really 35 and that was kind of its own democracy. You know, there was a different world for that and you, it was quite expensive and elaborate. And so you really couldn't make beautiful stuff outside of those walls. And so I feel like um, not that the early renditions of Red were any good, but there was this like birth of young filmmakers that were rich kind of guys that were making these music videos and there was kind of this new breath. And so, um, you know, there those DPs, Kind of came out of the gate and we're like oh i'm a dp now after graduating film school i didn't have a camera i didn't i wasn't that person i was a bit more old school in that i kind of throughout film school always thought that i would earn my right to be that in yeah. some way by crewing and so i just always had it in my mind that i'm going to kind of work my way up to it um it ended up being three years of it which was great i i thought it'd be longer at crewing you know i was intending on working longer um i kind of got lucky that it was also around this time was the birth of like streaming content, branded content yeah. in terms of the need for stuff online, because all of a sudden, you know, YouTube, you could stream HD video, which is a new thing back then. It was a yeah. long time ago. And so, you know, all of a sudden uh, fashion behind the scenes was a big thing for me. You know, that kind of need for like, we just need a guy to shoot some stuff on a stage behind the scenes and we're going to, you know, I'll, I'll be that guy. Yeah, sure. You know, well, so every, every I got lucky. Became also wanted video as well all of a sudden do you know what i mean and yeah yeah exactly so everyone has had a thirst for that especially you know i was kind of in uh i kind of fell into kind of a fashion company or two that i was working with or some dps that i was assisting that were fashion people and so there became in that world a real need for for content you know for video yeah and so uh whether it was i mean they're all so boring now if you watch them they're like you know, talking head portrait to B-roll of the shoot. And then, back, you know, it's incredibly stiff. But, you know, for me, it was, um, it paid well. And that gave me freedom to not crew anymore. Yeah. And it also, you know, part of it sort of felt like learning how those sets were behaving in terms of who's, okay, what are the the politics of it? You know, I would be behind the scenes, but I would sort of be absorbing you know, and witnessing all these interactions of the producer and the talent and the, you know, the agency and trying to sort of witness that and absorb it. So I think that was really a good kind of spy time in my life where I could, you know, to absorb those those things on set. So it was, it was a cool experience. I think that eventually I got frustrated because I felt like I should, I should be in the scene. I, I want to be actually on in the yeah, actual yeah. film. I don't want to be the guy behind the guy. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that became interesting. But yeah, I got lucky that that was sort of a, a, a vanishing point of that time in in the digital needs and the technology of like the 5D, the RED, all these cameras that can now sort of compete in their own weird way. Yeah. yeah. And so that was kind of my my first few years in the business. Um, and again, those kind of behind the scenes jobs mixed with, uh, I had a friend whose pr uh, wife was a producer at an agency. Uh, they brought me in a lot to shoot case studies and sort of pitch videos and all sorts of odds and ends internally. And so that kind of showed me what commercials could be, what they were. I would hear, you know, behind the scenes conversations about, you know, looking for directors and DPs. And I could kind of, you know, again, kind of spy on those aspects too. And, manipulate later on, you know, use some of the lingo I might learn on those sets and like try to sort of behave in a certain way. And I was only 23, 24, but like would be on these sets and like wear a college shirt and like pretend like I was kind of like, this, <laughs> you know, this fancy DP guy because I'd seen people come in that door at the agency and behave that way. I thought, okay, well, if that's who they're hiring, maybe I'll, I'll yeah. kind of chameleon my way into becoming that. So it kind of worked. I mean, to be honest, you kind of, you know, bullshit your way into it, but, but, uh, but yeah, that was my first few years in the business. 
And then where was there, was there like a, you know, I, I've had heard this story, I think, before on, on other yeah. podcasts you've done, but <laughs> just for, for our audience, like the, when was there like a turning point where you felt like there was like, you went from that to like closer to what you're doing now? Yeah, I mean, I, I did a couple of failed specs. I had a director, I had two directors in New York that I was really close friends with, and we were all frustrated. We were working on sort of reenactment TV shows and like, again, the kind of fashion behind the scenes and really nothing to show for ourselves. And this is like, you know, early 20s. And um, we kept wanting to make some sort of spec commercial or spec film or something because no one else was going to give us a chance to shoot something cool. Yeah. And so we thought, well, we're going to have to make it on our own and, and you know, pull, pull some money together and do it. And so we had two, two of them were not very good, uh, one of which was terrible, uh, <laughs> which is a real bummer because, you know, you'd have this big buildup, you'd be, you know, beg borrowing and dealing, asking for favors, renting a truck and all this stuff, and then doing this thing and getting to the edit room and and being like, well, this is kind of shit. And maybe I'm terrible. I, I don't, you know, because I think part of the frustration early on, you can be the biggest cinephile, you can go to film school, you can be a nerd, you can be so smart, all, all these things. But if you haven't actually done it and actually put it on screen, you'll never nearly know if you have the chops. I mean, that's the sort of challenge of it. It can all be a big fantasy, and that's a scary part, but it is true. I mean, again, not keep arguing back to sports, but it's kind of like anybody can be, you know, shooting hoops in the gym by themselves and make it every shot. And it's like now you're in the game, fourth quarter, yeah. are you actually going to be the one to make, you know, that's the test. And so it was a frustrating time for sure. Um, and then it was really kind of a year later that we did um, a basketball-based one and uh, again, it was just a two day thing. It was like a couple hours one day, a couple hours the next day. You know, it was a mixture of things. I think we had a really good location, really good talent. Um, I had a couple of core friends that really were important to me to come help out. Yeah. And it just kind of clicked. I mean, the edit came together, um, the sound design, and it just really, that was kind of like the best moment of my career at that point. I, I felt like I, I finally, I was like, okay, you're not full of shit. You actually know what you're doing somehow. You were able to put, yeah. you know, through something, a wire in your body, you were able to put it on screen. And that really felt great. And so yeah, that was really the first time, I think that was 2013 or 14. And that was really, I mean, I hope everyone gets to experience that. I, I think, you know, hopefully you've experienced that. I'm sure you yeah. have in some way. I think that that was to me the beginning of it all. Um, and then from there, you kind of learn what you like and don't like. I mean, that's what I sort of think about this whole thing as is really about forming your taste and it, all you're hired for is your taste and you have to develop that. And it does take years to kind of saturate it and figure out, yeah. okay, what do I offer productions? What, what do I have to offer them? And so if you look at that piece now, years later, there still is, I think you can see a spark of like, okay, this is kind of what my sauce is. This is kind okay. of what you know, my taste is. Um, it felt like me for the first time. So that yeah. was a, a great time for sure. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, I think, that was definitely when I, you know, when I was at the beginning of my DP career, I think the moment that I realized it was starting to work was when I showed my wife, you know, one of the jobs that I'd done. And I don't think I said it like, you know, this is one of the jobs I'd done. She just said, oh, this looks like one of your jobs. And, you know, you think, all oh, right, yeah. okay, now I'm starting to like create a, you know, a yeah. look for myself, yeah. you, know, you know, like a, yeah. a um, uh, you know, like a trend of what my jobs might look like. In, the, in yeah. the future and like how I'm going to shoot the rest of my stuff. Yeah, it's 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 really flattering because I think that for all of our heroes have some sort of semblance of that, you know, that sort of as much as we don't want to be stamped with like, here's my style, this is all I do. Yeah, there still is like there are people, you know, if I listed my five heroes, there is a nuance to what they offer. You know, there's something, a connective thread throughout their careers that has their, you know, yeah. patina. There's something special they're doing that um, only they can bring, you know, sort of. And I think, you know, it is challenging, maybe in, in short form, it can be a bit like copy and paste and you can be become, you know, um, you know, we often end up doing the same thing too much and then it becomes yeah. a crutch and there's that sort of thing, which is the bad side. But, you know, I do think you have to sort of respect your gut and if you're drawn to things, you should be drawn to them for the right reasons and you just kind of have to let it drive you. But uh, it's an inter interesting thing because I think that, you um you're not always aware of it and i think that we're you know there's a certain <laughs> essence that you might bring to it and that's the cool part is that you know um film is such an unusual art and that it's pretty hard to copy someone it, of course you can rip them off and you can do your best to derive from it 
but it's kind of like it's always going to feel a bit different no matter what. It's never going to be the exact same, whether it's better or worse, yeah. probably worse. It's never really going to be the same. So, you know, um, at this point for me in references and like watching stuff, I, I really like I try to even start fresh every job with like, OK, I'm only going to reference films. I feel like those are sort of the gold standard for references. And I feel like, you know, in terms of developing my taste from here on out, on out I've tried to just really keep it at that as the high ground and sort of. I feel like in short form, I've tried to sort of look at that less a little bit the last two years, maybe, and just kind of like, okay, this is, it's going to be here on this plane. I'm going to look above it, you know, for yeah. inspiration. And uh, so, you know, in terms of color and lighting, and all these things, every lookbook for a job is usually for me almost entirely cinema, unless there's something technical, which is certainly commercials are much more technical often because they're doing special things in a much shorter burst. That's something where I'm like, okay, how'd that gag work? What are they doing with the camera? You know, that kind of stuff. But I try best I can to have the actual source be from cinema, you know, lately. But that wasn't always the case for sure. So do you um, find do you find that you get a lot of people coming to you asking for a particular, you know, do you feel like you, you've honed that style and people are coming to you saying, Oh, I saw you did that. We want to kind of do the same thing, or you know. How do you, how it's a do you, good question. I mean, I think it's always an interesting thing. I'm sure you've experienced it where you see your work in the treatment or in the, the the agency board, which is always a really sort of weird, bizarre. You're like, oh, I guess people actually do watch it, you yeah, know, which yeah. is a great feeling. But, um, so there's been many occasions like that, which is interesting, where you go, well, actually, just give me the job. I sh I shot that board. You just give me the <laughs> fucking job. I should be like, I'm the first hole. Why, you know? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think that. It's interesting because I, I work with the core, just a couple of directors for the most part. Yeah. But yeah, I think that I'm I'm not in a place where I really want to be revisiting stuff, regurgitating my own work. You know, there's, and you know, you shoot sports too. I think sports is its own thing where it's just so much copy and paste of the same look and same everything all over the world now. And it's kind of garbage. And I'm pretty over the like single light with the smoke and the guy lifting weights. And you're like, okay, here's the old thing, you know. And we we've all done it. Some of us well, some not so well. And I've revisited some of those tropes, you know, occasionally. But I've really, the last like year and a half, two years, tried to push as hard as I can against the expectations of the job. I try to come in and think, well, what if it's this way? Or I, tr I really want to be difficult, you yeah. know, about it, if whether that's good or bad. But I'm just try. I really, for my own satisfaction, for my own growth, you know, for the growth of the, the director, I just am not interested in and just sort of doing what we've already done and new worked. There's, of course, going to be an essence of me in there. That's just, again, what taste is. Yeah. That's what, you know, the experience lies. But I think that, yeah, the last, like, two years, I'm trying to push it where I'm much more fussy and difficult about it, you know, in general. Like, how can we work harder to make yeah. this special and different, you know? Um, whether that works or not, it doesn't always work. Such in commercials, you know, you win, you lose a lot of your battles uh, for big ideas. But then you have a couple that you might see through. So, um, but yeah, I think at this point there's sort of, it's, you know, I think a, a big part of it too, is like what you showcase, you know, the work that you're out outputting Yeah. because there are many, you know, sports commercials I do every year that I don't, I don't want to really promote that anymore. So I don't really show a ton of that unless it's really fucking good. Yeah, I yeah. don't show it because I already have the sports stuff I like. And I feel like those are, if, if they're not better than that, I'm not going to share it. If it's not going to take the place of that project on the reel. Yeah, it's yeah. not worth showcasing it even on, on Instagram or something else. I don't, I don't post it. So I think um, that pile has grown, but I'm, I'm happy with that, that choice not to showcase that work because it has kind of sculpted things a bit. Um, and, you know, part of it was an effort, maybe 2018. I really wanted to expand more into kind of like outdoor scope, like it's hard to describe, but like I did some sort of uh, rock climbing spots and some outdoor stuff and like, just I kind of wanted to just get a bit wider and, and a little more yeah, breath. Yeah, definitely. And so, you know, I got lucky. I did that that um, that ski job in New Zealand, which is part of that. You know, where we really got, you know, obviously it's all about scope and and sort of terrain and and so I think I tried to expand the sports I was showing or that kind of work to show. Okay, well, it's not about gym sports anymore. It's now about outdoors yeah. and bigger scale. And so. You know, um, luckily, some of that came true that I was able to kind of will some of that into, you know, by luck or by will was able to kind of get some of that stuff in my reel, which is yeah. great. So um, um, I was happy I made that effort a couple of years ago. I mean, I'm a massive fan of the 
of the Gatorade ad that you did. You know, I think it, it, what year was that that you shot that? I think it must. That was, that was 2017. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. one, um, yeah. Serena Williams. You know, there was a whole bunch of people in that one. You know, I think the thing I liked the most about it was it, it, it definitely what didn't follow that kind of you know. Uh, you know that sports trend almost you know what i mean it felt slightly yeah, yeah. more timeless and a bit more like considered in everything that it was doing it didn't look like you were guys were like there just mopping up everything you could it, it felt like it was definitely a more yeah, well, ent ent entity yeah i mean i'm happy to hear that i i told you before i mean i, I have days where i hate it days i don't hate that spot yeah. i think you know that's that's the artist curse right i mean yeah. we all sort of that's the burden we carry but you know, that I was very cognizant of that spirit. That was, you know, I, it's weird. I sort of I can't say I'd always do it, but I have these like mantras for each calendar year of like a word or a buzz phrase or something that I sort of want the year to take, to take place as. And 2017 was timeless. That was a word that I really, I thought about a lot. And I think, you know, it started probably from the, the filmmakers that I admire that do commercials, when I look at like Wally Pfister and Rupert Sanders' work from the early 2000s or, yeah. um, you know, Greg Frazier, there's, there are spots that those guys did, especially in sports, that could have come out today. They yeah, look yeah. so timeless and they're so big and effortless and they're so cinematic. They're all these things. And so I kept looking at when I got Gatorade, I was so nervous, of course, it's a huge scale job. I'd never worked with Matt, the director before. And I was actually really quite tired. I mean, we had come off, I come off of, the best run of my career at that point. I had done three months of like all sorts of travel jobs, all different things. A lot of them, you know, two weeks in a row, different jobs, you know, really complicated, difficult travel work. Yeah. And so I was at the very tail end of a travel, um, a two a two state like cross country job, the whole thing, and got that board. And so I was like, my initial reaction was like, man, I don't know, it's just so intense. Like, you know, I don't know what I'm gonna do, and Michael Jordan and all this stuff. And so. I, when I started referencing and looking at what it wanted to look like, I kept thinking back to those spots from the early 2000s. You know, there's one that's called the Floor Generals, which is a beautiful Rupert Sanders spot, NBA spot. And I kept thinking, like, what is it that they're doing differently? What is it that, like, makes these things so timeless? And it's really, it's so simple, but it's really about um, color temperature. There's nothing fancy. It's really almost a neutral white. It's, like, very neutral. Yeah. Maybe a bit of cold, a bit of warm, but nothing flashy. There's no colored light. There's yeah. no, it's not anamorphic. There's no gimmicks. There's nothing that, that they're hiding behind. You know, it's really just like good lighting, good camera work and good performance. And that's the sort of the backbone of it. And so that really became the measuring stick for that spot. And so that became why it was spherical. That became why it's a very neutral white for the most part. We only use tungsten or daylight. There's nothing colored in it whatsoever. Kind of to the chagrin of Matt and the agency, I, I sort of, you know, part of the maybe distaste that I have now is because the agency had a very different idea of what it wanted to look like. They, the script to me read, so it's about honesty and about secrets and about sort of, yeah. you know, being okay with losing and all these things. So I always interpreted it as being a very kind of um, just very simple, understated kind of experience. I, I didn't think it wanted to be flashy and weird. And and then I got, so maybe a week after getting the job, the this like head honcho creative it's a big agency, very powerful. They've had Gatorade for like 35 years. Yeah. Big deal. This like creative exec sends this like Bible, look Bible of like what the thing wants to look like. And it was so different. I mean, it was, it was these, it, they wanted maybe do uh black and white 16, like double X and like all these weird things, like weird lenses. And they talked about scanning the, the digital uh, printing to film and scanning it back to digital, all this weird stuff. And I was like, man, this really doesn't feel at all like the way I read the spot. It doesn't feel, it yeah, feels like yeah. a, a whole different animal. And so there are things, they're subtle, but like the lensing occasionally is a bit wider and closer than I wanted it to be. There's a couple of things that the agency kept tapping me on the shoulder saying, well, how is it weirder? Can we make it weirder? What can we do to make this stranger? And so I kept thinking, I don't know if you're listening to what there's the audience or the characters are saying, but like, this is so different than that. We don't need a gimmick. Yeah. You know, the spot is already cool. Like, it doesn't need to have that. And so, I, yeah, there's, like, for instance, the agency version that went to air does have, like, a film, a very heavy film grain. Right. They put a weird fake film, like, 
flair thing over Serena's first close up in it that I was just like, guys, like, what are we doing? <laughs> this is madness. But, you know, again, as always in commercials, you forgive those, oh, those yeah. leashes. You don't, you don't have, you have no control over it. So, you know, when it came to Matt and I's cut, you know, our version is looks the way I intended it to look, but I think, yeah, I'm happy to hear that it, it views that way, that it is timeless. I, I'm happy that we didn't, you know, he wanted more flares and he was like, oh, we got to add a little more sauce. We got to add a little more. And we didn't do any of that stuff. And I'm, I'm, I stand by that. I'm happy we didn't yeah. do that way. And, it, and I think, you know, there are a few projects like that because my work certainly does get a bit saucy at times, whether I like it or not. Uh, sometimes it comes out that way or sometimes I feel that it wants to be that way in, in itself. But I think that there are several projects where I really held back and really try to be more understated. And those are ones that I do find to be kind of timeless in their way, where I hope that, you know, in four or five years, you could look back and be like, oh, yeah, that's not too dated. Whereas not to be um, to beat up on some of the work being put out now, but I do think that our worlds in short form, it's gotten really polluted the last like three or four years. Yeah. I have to say, like, you know, Internet culture is unfortunately to blame. There's just been this really blah, like everyone's just kind of copying and pasting each other. And it's you know, the whole sort of um, this like shot on film jerk off. It's just a lot of stuff that I feel like you got well, really uh, tired. The whole yeah, thing. No, I think really. I yeah. Think, I don't I know think what I your thoughts are on that. I think there's definitely going to be a, a weird moment where people realize that shooting on 16 mil just to shoot on 16 mil isn't like cool anymore. And then, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, I just, part of that going around. Yeah, and it became, you know, uh, the combination of all these different things that everyone was doing, like shooting with colored light and doing all this goofy kind of millennial anthem stuff. And like, it became the same spot you see over and over again throughout the world. Yeah. And I just kept thinking, man, like in two years, are you going to want to look back and look at any of that work? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> you know, it's, again, like you're looking at these spots that I mentioned, you know, Rupert Sanders and Wally Pfister are 15 years old. And they look magnificent still. They look yeah. amazing. And they and that's what I'm striving for personally. I, I want my work to be that. You know, that's what I'm trying to get to. And so, yeah, for everyone that's just kind of riding a trend and maybe gets a bit hot because of that now, I mean, party on, like to each his own. But I feel like I'll, as, a, as an artist myself, I hope to personally be happy with my work ultimately. And for me, that becomes maybe not doing what everyone else is doing and, and just yeah. riding trends, you know. I mean, um, I'm watching... Yeah. I was watching I think I think when we met I think we spoke about like films like Dark Knight and like but it, like more recently I was watching um like uh The Last Crusade the uh, Indiana Jones and sure, I mean, sure. those films are like so old do you know what I mean but you you can still watch them today and they're like they hold up so well like they're just like the look and the feel of them like even you know Dark Knight is you know slightly you know slightly newer but it's still you can watch it and think to yourself, you know, in 50 years time, this film is still going to be like yeah. outstanding. Well, yeah, I mean, I watched I watched a couple, you know, uh, we were running out of stuff to watch. So I watched the whole Dark Knight series in lockdown. And, um, you know, the first one's 2000. They shot it in 2004. Yeah, it looks I mean, that's so that's 16 years ago. It When, I, when you see compared to something else shot in 2004, it is <laughs> I mean, it's bonkers how bad stuff looked, you know, beyond yeah. that film. And so, but again, I actually, I don't know if you watched, while I did a couple of, of um, Instagram lives over the course of the last few weeks. Um, and he, he actually talked about his style and that, that, that sort of timeless thread. And he talked about how, you know, sure, you can come in and do a big goofy blue backlight and do all the stuff that was still, believe it or not, in vogue in the early 2000s. You think that's more of like an 80s, 90s thing. There are still many films I'll watch that are from the early 2000s that have that carryover of yep. like gosh, this stupid you know blue thing and really garish ideas, and he you know it was nice to hear him say that that he chose not to do those things to light it classically, and really mostly again with a neutral white or a bit warm and a bit cold and that's it you know yep. and that's really timeless and so um, you know and again people like Steve Annis you know those are people that same thing you know, people uh, all sort of the heroes of short form. If you look at their work, for the most part, it's because they're keeping it classical. They're not really, you know, they're keeping it within the confines of those things. Um, and so, yeah, I think people like Wally, et cetera, you know, they were able to to evade those gimmicks and be like, no, I'm just doing it this way. It's going to look beautiful and it'll hold up in many, many years. And so, 
you know, that's why, yeah, all of Nolan's work, all of those guys' work, it will stand the test of time because they didn't ride trends. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not stamped in time that way. So, um, I mean, going to like the other end, slight one, not the other end, you know, moving along the spectrum slightly. I mean, your, um, the vodka spot that you did for, is it Nemiroff? Like, you know, I, yeah. you know, it's still got a great look and it still looks amazing, but you definitely have thrown in a lot more kind of, um, you know, the transitions that you guys use on that and, uh, you know, a lot more of the kind of camera movements and that kind of thing, yeah. and especially with like the, in the cage with the UFC fighters. I mean, you know, I love it. I think it's great. And I, I noticed also on the Red Bull spot that you did together, you and Noah, there is a lot of that kind of, um, you know, those transitions and the slightly yeah. you know, frame rate kind of effects. I mean, are those yeah. things, but my curiosity was, you know, are those things within those spots pre thought out? Are they more like kind of on set kind of experimental or how do they, how do those come about? Yeah, I mean, um, part of it, I think, comes from the editor is Josh Bodner, who's a, a good friend of, of Noah. He's at White House in L.A., and he's yep. edited you know, all of our spots together. And that's part of his style, I think, as an editor. He likes those kind of flashy. That's kind of how he cuts. He's very quick, quickly paced and a lot of energy. And I think so, sort of some of that comes out of his style. But um, for Nemiroff, I mean, we uh, – or actually to come back because Red Bull was first. Red Bull um, – we try, I'm sure you have the experience too, where you're meant to shoot so much in the day that those kind of textural details get lost yeah. in the schedule. Like those are the first things to be cut. Oh yeah. And so, you know, for instance, the guy's making a motorcycle, there's all this stuff of him with like, you know, shaving debris and sparks, which we've all seen a million times, but they're always cool. Um, there in on the days were so difficult and, and long that we got like 30 seconds to shoot any of that on the actual day. And so, when we got back to the States and, and Josh was editing, um, it was really dead. The spot was really suffering because it had no sort of speed and energy. It needed that sort of third piece to yeah. kind of like bring it together. And so uh, Noah and I actually spent two nights um, in New York shooting those sort of cutaway textural beats. We did all sorts of weird fuck up stuff with like, you know, with uh, burning steel wool and a fish tank and yeah. on his roof with like a, a drill spinning, you know, we just experimented kind of with science. Uh, and actually it sort of came because I had done, believe it or not, I had ingested the edit into my computer and actually went to find cool science macro stuff on YouTube and ripped, did like a rip matic basically and ripped different ideas and put them into a timeline to share with Noah and Josh. And so we actually sort of uh, re-engineered it to be, okay, we need a spinning thing here to connect to a wheel. And so it sort of became actually you know, reverse engineered. So it's kind of interesting that way. And that was the first time I sort of had that. But I think, you know, Noah and I have done enough work together where I feel I'm trusted enough to do that, to offer that, that there's no bad ideas. Not every director is going to love you bringing the edit into the timeline yeah, yeah. and manipulating it in your own. You know, it's not always the most elegant thing. But um, so to answer your question, yeah, I mean, I think those elements, a lot of them came later. Um, but I think the spot really benefited from it. It needed that kind of to connect the worlds and, you know, cause I think that it's already kind of a, the premise is something we've seen a million times, the maker making kind of thing we've seen yeah, yeah. so much, you know, it's just been, it's been an advertising and short form for so many years that you have to find ways to bring new life to that format, you know? And so, you know, the sort of textual cutaways are nothing new, but I thought that, you know, it was fun to do it and experiment. And so I'm quite pleased and, you know, I, I've, um, that's one of my favorite spots, you know, because of it. So yeah, yeah, no, I, think, no. uh, I look back fondly at that. But but with Nemiroff, you know, I tried to expand more. There were in the agency version uh, a lot more sort of on the nose transitional stuff like match cutting, which we've seen fucking a hundred times, like just so over it. And so I said, well, I had been experimenting with different shutter angle stuff, blurry shutter, weird sort of under cranking, over cranking, just kind of fucking up with the medium. And so um, when it came to that, we shot that in South Africa. Um, I said, well, we'll do these transitional uh, match frames, but I want to do them as more burnout, where it'd be like, we'll do a funky version, a normal version, and then kind of a semi-funky version, yeah. all the same size frame. And we'll do like weird buzzy stuff and you'll kind of, you know, blend it together or whip out or, you know, use it as needed. They ended up not really using a ton of them. Um, there were more that I thought were really cool that I, you know, I really cared about, but uh, 
they were used sparingly because it is kind of a gimmick. I think it was used sparingly for a reason. And so I respect that. Um, but that just to me added something a little bit more in camera, a little more flavor to it that, and I think with a little bit of sound design, it really kind of adds that connection in a cool way. Yeah. And kind of, again, like a film burnout, like a digital burnout, basically. Yeah. Um, I think it definitely like builds, you know, it just creates an instant energy. Do you know what I mean? Like, like you, it, without having to like throw the camera around or make the lights flash. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like that, you, yeah, yeah you're you're exactly. instantly building the energy of the, of the ad. Yeah. And that's something, you know, that's like a Tony Scottism. That's, uh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of directors that I admire that that fucked around with Shutter and, you know, chopping it up and making it weirder and, and just kind of, you know, using it for all the format for all it's worth, you know, trying to experiment with it. And um, again, for me, like always trying to do to add new stuff in camera, if I can, I will say, I mean, it's incredibly exhausting to buzz the camera that way. I remember the first time <laughs> yeah. doing it for like a two minute take and you're whipping the camera back and forth for the whole time. But but, you know, I went on to do different instances of that throughout the rest of that year. It's something I've leaned on occasionally just to throw in a little bit of curveball energy occasionally as a different take. Um, and again, if they use it, they use it. If not, you know, yeah, party on. We, we tried it. For instance, we did a spot for ASICs, me and Noah in Ukraine, and we tried it for a whole sequence and it looked terrible. It was really <laughs> stupid. And we didn't cut to it. And it's, you know, running didn't make any sense in it. Like for that, for that sort of uh, effect, it didn't work at all. And we said, okay, that was stupid. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you just try, you know, you, you try some stuff, but it was, um, yeah, that was a fun couple of things. But yeah, I mean, with Nemiroff, like that was kind of a nice one because that felt like, again, back to sort of the outdoor stuff and this, you know, skiing and landscape, that kind of was like the culmination of all that work. I had done a summer's worth of that kind of stuff. And then when I saw the boards for that spot, it was obviously the dirt bikes and the uh, rock climbing. And, and so um, luckily I was able to have had that experience of those previous couple of jobs and bring those right to that job. So yeah. I felt like it was a really, it kind of married a lot of things that I cared about together, you know, ideas and, and a bit of sports, a bit of kind of sexy lifestyle, a bit yeah. of outdoors. It kind of, I was very it, lucky to kind of, wait it looked like, in. you know, watching it, it looked like kind of like a DP's wet dream. Do you know what I mean? Like there yeah. seems to be like a lot of elements within it and yeah. like a lot of chance to like, you know, experiment with like the camera and lighting, do you know what I mean? But then also yeah. keep that, keep a lot of, like you said, there's like a mixture of like sports and lifestyle and, and yeah. uh, cool locations. Yeah. And luckily, you know, uh, work with Noah, I mean, he, he really had the ear of the agency and client on that one. They really looked to him to shape the creative as much yeah. as he wanted. So, you know, we wanted, or he wanted, he's a big motorcycle guy. And so he wrote that whole scene in. He's like, you got to put a, a bike scene in. You know? <laughs> and so it became, well, what if we do it this way? And so adding scenes that he knew would look good for us. Uh, and that personally, we just wanted to shoot. It'd be fun to do it. Although yeah. it was kind of a nightmare at the end. But, um, but uh, you know, that was also one. That job came to me when I was quite tired. I really, um, again, I had been traveling internationally on these big jobs and was really exhausted and jet lagged. And you know, the, really the last thing I wanted to do was go to, to two weeks to Cape Town and do this really difficult, complicated job. And I was just really, but of course I was going to go do it. But I just, at the time, physically and mentally was so spread thin. But something I did, which uh, maybe we've talked about before, which I, I do when I can, is, is go for director scouts for free. Basically, I go a week early um, for travel jobs. Uh, and that is such a, a, a gift because you have time not only to physically acclimate to the jet lag or just get used to being in the place, but it really gives you so much more time to prep because uh, I'm sure any DP can experience that a tech scout, if it's the first time you're seeing something and you have a big scale thing, you know, you're building a set or you're doing a massive scene or again, like if I just wandered into a scout for the the boat scene, for instance, which is a huge undertaking for Nemiroff, off the plane into a scout with like crew, yeah. I don't know, you know, that'd be so, it's so challenging. We do it. Uh, it's not great, but we definitely do it. Um, luckily that was one where I'd already been in town for a week. And so I'd seen stuff multiple times. I had, you know, no and I are in the hotel room going over, you know, really steeping in it. And so yeah. I think, uh, that was such a good time for me to just like rest, recover, you know, steep in the material. And I think the job really worked better because of it. So I was grateful to have that time, you know, to be there on the ground um, yeah. and to put it on screen. Cause you know, we did a ton of scouting all far away, you know, going through different iterations. And if I just had to inherit 
you know, his ideas or someone else's ideas about what it should be. And you get there and you go, wait a minute, like, what about this giant thing, you know, or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. If that defeats your vision, that's it's tough, you know, and, and it's too late. I think like some, a small, tiny detail that, you know, a non-DP would might miss, do you know what I mean? It's like, so it could be like hugely detrimental to like, even just like logistically, do you know what I mean? To the shooting. Yeah, yeah it's paramount. I mean, it's such a thing. So, you know, it's one of those things I was lucky to do that for a number of jobs, but it doesn't always work out. But uh, man, I mean, I try to make the most of it when it does. Yeah. I really, it's such a gift to do it. And again, you, you're donating your time to be there, but it's like, I'd rather just, you know, have a hotel room and just be able to take notes and go look at things two or three times. Cause you know, I don't know about you. I, I'm not really, it takes me a couple of times to see something in person to really know what it wants to be. You know, I'm not, yeah. I mean, sometimes your, your gut tells you exactly what it wants to be, but I often need time to really either see it in person a couple of times. I need to really go back to the hotel room, really absorb all my documents and pictures and really brainstorm. Cause I think that something I was hard on myself early on and still am is again like how to push things further and uh what didn't i think of like because of course with lighting with all of it it can always be better we yeah. all know that you always run out of time and ideas but i'm always thinking okay well what have i not unlocked like what what piece of this you know i saw a look at the same fucking scout photos for 10 hours in the room yeah, yeah. And like what have i not cracked like what piece of this have i not thought about and sometimes you have ideas at the 10th hour, sometimes you don't. And your first idea was the best one. But, you know, that's an exciting place to be is when you can really sit there in the room and be like, OK, yes, this is what it should be. What if we do this? Yeah. And so that's the cool you know, bit of homework that I think um, I recommend anybody that's not doing it. <laughs> I think I, I think I, one thing I struggle with a lot is that whenever I, you know, either look at boards or read a script or read a treatment is I, I'm, you know, I can visualize it quite well in my head. I'm quite good at that kind of thing. But then obviously that's like, that's completely irrelevant to like what the shoot's actually even going to be like. Do you know what I mean? Because what I'm thinking oh, yeah. inside my head is, you know, you know, and quite often the, the agency boards or something are like, just, you know, they're just drawings, ran, you know, oh, yeah. drawings of Terrible, nothing. Yeah. And we haven't even maybe picked a country that we're going to go to yet sometimes. And so it's then like, it's then like working out the best way to create you know what you've got up here into those locations and like molding those locations to become that kind of idea I yeah i mean i think scouting i mean it's been said many times but like that's everything i think that yeah you know i want to be involved with that as early and early as i can be because i mean a bad location there's no way to address it like you, it's so yeah. hard to you can put lipstick on a pig you know what i mean you can try to you know put fancy light and, and to me that's really where you get into a bad space is like again, back to sort of the gimmick stuff that's being done now is they're hiding behind the medium by the film, yeah. by the color light. It's all a mask. You know, they're just hiding. You know, if you really look at what's being done and what's in your frame, it's not that great. But I think that, you know, for me, the filmmakers that I admire, the people that I admire, um, they think long and hard about what's in frame. And so that's something that I'm really always serious about. And Again, the space will inspire you. I mean, that's so much of what the audience is going to be responding to is the space itself and who's yeah. it, what they're wearing and the whole thing. But it's, you know, yeah. And it's, you know, again, like part of that too, that I will say with travel jobs especially is to not just do the same because on for service companies, I find they often just want to re you know, revisit places that already work. Oh, yeah. And so that's something that the directors I'm close with, I'm always, we're always pushing each other, we're pushing the, the scouts whoever it is on the ground, okay, we've seen this in a hundred spots. Like, you know, you go to Ukraine, it's like, okay, there's the 10 most popular fucking commercial sports thing, you know, whatever it is, it's like, okay, yeah, here's the key of hits. And you okay, okay, well, we can't do those because those have been shot out. So yeah. let's start from the ground up. What can we do? And so, you know, um, that's something wherever we go, uh, wherever I go on, on these shoots, I'm always, tr we're trying to go, go on our own little wander and walk down alleyways. I mean, for instance, in Red Bull, you know, uh, the the absolute best looking stuff was lo a location that no one I searched for like two days on our own. The agency hated the idea of shooting on the actual streets. They thought they were dirty and ugly. You know, the stuff that as a Westerner all looks like Blade Runner to us, you know, the neon and the weird smoke and, you know, the noodle carts. And so in the end, we actually um, sort of tricked the agency. We sort of were meant to go somewhere else on a move. And we actually veered off for an hour just with the camera and the actor and just like told them, yeah, we'll come to you guys. We're on our way. We're stuck in traffic or whatever we bullshitted. 
and went and shot the arguably the best looking stuff we shot in yeah. that hour. And so, but we had had to do the groundwork to like, you know, we were kind of frustrated to be honest, because there's daytime, you're walking around the streets trying to find inspiration, you know, it's there somewhere, but you have to kind of, you know, and so it just took like that extra couple hours to like, okay, no, it's hot. Yes. But let's walk down here and keep going. And we found that little pocket and, you know, on the day it lived up to what we hoped it could be. So, you know, that's such a big part of it. I think it's, it's one of the like trickiest things, especially in London is that, you know, like you said, everything has just been shot out. Like, and I, you yeah. know, I, as like a person who works in the industry, I sit watching things and I go, oh, look, know where that yeah. is, know where that is. Yeah. So like, yeah, like you said, like I always, always am thinking like, right, has this location been in anything? Do you know what I mean? Or like, yeah. can, we, can, we, can we find somewhere that is this, but like completely unique? Do you know what I mean? Especially like yeah. rooftops. Like we did this thing last year um, for a clothing brand and we needed a rooftop and every single one they'd, they'd offered up to us from the location company were really like just the same one with the same view and uh, yeah. we really pushed hard to get like something different and unique and it was definitely a rooftop I'm, I'm sure it's been shot before like there's no doubt yeah. but it was not one that I was like oh, I know where that is or something yeah and it's hard again you know New York's the same way I mean, I don't really work that much in New York, but uh, and maybe you don't work that much in London, probably, I imagine. But um, but yeah, it's it's hard because, you know, again, you inherit the material. We have no if they write a, a scene, a girl, a steady cam scene of a girl on a roof at sunset. You're like, OK, well, we've seen we've seen this before. <laughs> you know? yeah. There's only so many ways to do it. And um, so, yeah, those are scenes that you hope you can do otherwise. But it's yeah, it's a challenge for sure to keep reinventing it, especially now that we all we're all seeing each other's work throughout the world. You know, it's sort of like, again, there was each market kind of had its time where it's like, okay, here's the Cape Town world. Here's the Kia. And so it becomes like the, the greatest hits of those cities. Yeah. And you see all the stuff. And so, you know, it's just a matter of uh, what's hot right now. Like, and you start to be privy, but we're, we're so much more aware through social media, through Vimeo, whatever of international work that we're just like, it, you know, whereas 10, 15 years ago, you wouldn't probably have known what's airing in Tokyo or what's airing, yeah, yeah. you know, in uh, South America. So it's it's a good and bad thing. But I think for me, you know, it's silly. But again, sort of back to like the mantra words or like big picture ideas. I still in some way selfishly always want the work to be mysterious in some way. I want people to to have some you know mystery about it. Like they have questions about where it was, how you yeah. did something. Because I think that we have... To me, like there's only so many, th for one, in short form, no one really cares. No one really wants to see it. You know, the audience doesn't really <laughs> have anything invested in it. And so if you're lucky to have them watch two thirds of the thing, that's a gift. You know, you're already grateful for that. But so for me, selfishly within that, I think I want there to be some mystery about how they do it. Where was that? I don't want it to be a postcard of like, OK, they're in Barcelona. Here's all the Barcelona hits, yeah. you know, or, here's, you know, you're in Cape Town, whatever it is. And so trying to add something in there where it's a bit more mysterious, a bit, a bit of a, a veil of mystery to it where the audience can't instantly know. Because again, they've, especially the internet culture, they, they're they unimpressed. I mean, they've seen all of it. Like, you know, they, they've probably seen a hundred spots already shot in those same places, but what can you bring differently to it? Yeah. You know, um, and have your spin on it, but easier said than done. Um, but yeah. where do you, where do you find, uh, where do you want to push things? I mean, where now when you get back to work, I mean, do you feel like are you even more thirsty to like to pivot your your taste and push to somewhere else? Like, where do you sort of want it to go? You know, at least yeah, in this calendar year or next year? Definitely. I mean, I think at the moment, all I'm thinking about is just getting back to work full stop. But yeah. definitely once I'm once I'm back into it, definitely I want to just I th I think the one thing that I've learned from this time away is that, you know saying yes to like every job is not necessary do you know what i mean like we've yeah. had like two or three months off you know and i'm i'm someone who is always got like the inner fear of like the next job's not coming but you know, and, and, yeah, yeah. And it's so it's so, like it's, it's one of the easiest things to say oh no you know i'm just gonna only concentrate on you know the jobs i really want to do but then like this little job comes in and you're like oh i know i'll just do it it'll be fine so um I think definitely concentrating a bit on that and then also yeah just trying to really move towards the jobs that I do you know do want to do do you know what I mean and really hone yeah. that and 
And I think, but I think it has just slowly for me been like a natural progression into becoming that just because like you said, you know, the look and the feel of your work just slowly becomes something. And then it's and then, an organism. Yeah. yeah. It, it has a life of its own in a way. I mean, you, you, you have authorship, but it's not, yeah, it does at a certain point after doing this, you know, I've done this for 12 years, you know, it has its, a life of its own now. It's kind of, it is its own organism. And so, yeah. um, you know, it's its own entity, but, um, but yeah, I hear you saying, I think the pickiness thing is always tough. I think that, um, you know, when you're on a roll and you're doing back to back jobs, it's a really fun place to be. It can be. Um, yeah. but, but certainly, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, agents and people, higher ups are always like, Oh, you're, you're, you, you gotta be more available. You're not, you know, you're not being picking and choosing, but I think that the other side of that, it is, especially if you're someone that like, like me who's trying on every job to push it in some way beyond just like what's expected, you're going to learn something. You're going to experience something that you haven't done. You know, so I'm trying to do different techniques or use different equipment or try something where I can, I can learn, you know, yeah. on that job. But there are ones that you go, um, you know, an hour into the first day of shooting, you're like, Oh, like I wish <laughs> I hadn't said yes. This is not. And I think that to me, the, the biggest disappointment is in commercials in particular is, it, when a job goes from being something that could be on the reel or should be on the reel, and then throughout the first day of shooting, maybe or a second day of shooting, you start to realize it isn't quite what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, yeah. And then it becomes just a job, and that's not a great place to be. It happens to all of us. Um, sometimes they can be willed later to be something you at least share images from or something, but uh, those are fewer and far far between now. I feel like, but. Um, that's a sad place to be is when you, it goes from being something real worthy, maybe to being something that you're certainly not proud of. Uh, I had one of those experiences, one of my last jobs of this year. So, you know, I felt a bit duped where you're <laughs> like, I, you know, I feel a bit tricked into doing this job, but it was a great treatment. And, you know, then you see, but um, I think, so, I think you know, personally, though, I, I think I have like a, a mental state that there's always something to take from a job. Do you know what I mean? Like I've always had the, the idea of like people, there's always there's been DPs that I know who have been very very picky from the beginning and been like, you know, why am I going to do that job? You know, this and that. And I've had a slightly different take on it in terms of like, you know, you just never know like who you're going to meet on a job or like where that job might take you. And obviously, you have to make sure that you're available for, you know, the job that you do want to do. So it's tough. Yeah. Like, but again, you know, sometimes when a job feels like it's not going the way it goes you really never know where it's going to lead to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think the, the gamble is, you know, cause I've certainly turned out many jobs in my life. Um, you may sit around for weeks. You yeah. may do not, you know, that's the thing your agent might be like, Oh, you know, um, just give it a break. Like September is always hot. You got like a lot of music videos or something, whatever it is. Like there's something, yeah, just, just let's say no to the East couple. And then we're just going to, it's going to be great. All the stuff's going to roll in and, and all the cool, like, you know, uh, short form jobs will, will arrive and you that's the gamble you know it's not on them it's not on you that's just you know but i think for me i know i'm most healthy as a person when i am continuing to work and feel like i'm building something and, yeah. and i think that to lose that steam is frustrating so um yeah i'm, I'm often <laughs> quite upset oh you know maybe five days into that moment where you're like okay oh so clearly nothing's gonna book for this week now yeah you're like well i have to I had to eat those days, you know, and lose that money. But, but again, that's the gamble, um, you know, and they're higher stakes now. I think that you're in a certain realm where the jobs are worth a decent, a decent amount of money or, or privilege. And so, you know, if, if they overlap or schedule, it's complicated stuff, you know, to manipulate your schedule and, and to be available. But, um, you know, and again, for instance, like I did uh, a music video or two last year that, as a chance to try and do something different. I had, I've been kind of privileged in commercials for years and I thought I should mix it up and do some lower budget stuff. Didn't really work out the way I thought it would. I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, it's again, it's a gamble on those yeah. sort of lower end jobs. And I thought it was a worthy endeavor at the time. Now they aren't something I'll really showcase. That's just, you have to live with that. I mean, it's just part okay. of the fabric. Yeah. Just sort of say, okay, well, you know, it, it didn't blow up on YouTube, but no one's going to see this song. No one cares, that kind of thing. And and now, you know, eight months later or whatever, you're like, well, that was a thing. But but again, that's just the the, the fabric of it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I've thought a lot about who will come back on top. Like, do the same people, the same 
privileged directors and DPs, does everyone come back at the where they left off? Yeah. Are we back, you know, are we back to square one? Like I'm very curious to the 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 state of things in, yeah. in commercials and movies, but um, you know, we'll see. I was supposed to do maybe my first feature at the end of the year in Romania, which at this point seems to not be happening. So there's a lot of question marks for sure. Um, so we'll see. But yeah, in terms of commercials, yeah, I, I really don't know what, what will be the case. You know, uh, hopefully we all can pick up where we left off. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there's, there isn't anything at the moment you've kind of been chatting about restarting yet. Like, what is the actual state at the moment in, you know, it's kind of probably a question we should have started off with. But what is it like over there at the moment? Are people back to work or what's the deal at the moment looking forward for you? No, I mean, I think, you know, uh, we're supposed to still be at home. So I think there's, at least in New York, the this, this city's not open. Some of the states been open, but uh, it's California, the same thing. I think it's some counties, but not LA. Yeah. And so none of the markets that people film in are open, really. So, yeah. and certainly no one's traveling for work. And so I think, you know, again, like the job you talked about at the beginning, those kind of home-based commercials that people are, you know, owner-operators are shooting indoors or somewhere safe, I think are probably happening that I'm not part of. Um, I think part of the frustration for me is that my work is so foreign from those kind of jobs. It's not really the work that I do whatsoever. And so there is a personal fear of, you know, again, all the best work I've done has been travel, all international travel for the most part at a big scale, you know, all the things that basically are antithesis of what's happening now in terms of what the work will be. Um, so I try, I'm trying not to lose sleep over it, although I am. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, that remains to be seen. But yeah, certainly no one I know is properly working. There are those sort of online commercials or direct, directing from afar yeah, yeah. kind of thing. Um, again, as a consumer, I feel like there's going to be big fatigue on that stuff when it finally comes out. Um, I know I'm over it. I don't really need to be reminded of it in my commercials and my music videos or everything yeah, else. Yeah. Um, and so I think I would love to, I mean, once things are remotely open, I hope that there's a way to put other more creative things on screen like yeah. we used to and, and not just be about the same thing over and over again. So, um, but yeah, you know, the sort of tree of life kind of human stuff isn't really my bag to begin with. So, <laughs> you know, my work's still, now it's not really what I offer. So we'll see if I get those calls, but probably not. Um, but we'll see, you know, one positive thing I thought about was that I was starting to break into cars. I just did my biggest series of car spots before the break. And so I thought, well, you know, a Russian arm and a driver, those couldn't be, I mean, certainly the people are in the car, but yeah. you know, it's kind of a pretty distance and, and separated item. If you think about it, if you just yeah. turn sheet metal of a car ripping down the road, I mean, that's, that could be done, you know, we could do that safely. So, so that's the hope is that back uh, one in the boot. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, you know, while we're masked and honestly, I would love to have less people in the car anyway. It's pretty <laughs> annoying when an AC guy, when an AC guy gets in the car with you. So, uh, I would be uh, very receptive of that, of that, but, um, so we'll see, but yeah, I think, you know, just to finish up, I mean, I, I hope that, um, to continue where I left off in some ways, I, I'm sure there'll be a big rebuild process, but I think, you know, in terms of my, you know, creativity and ideas and aspirations, I'm I'm trying to yeah. remain my old self and hopefully come back, you know, that much more film literate. You know, I, I hope to come back and be having seen these. I mean, I think I've watched 40 films or 45 films this year or this lockdown. And so I'm trying to like, well, that's worth something. You know, hope those those are somewhere in my brain yeah, yeah. now and I can use it some way. So um hopefully not in vain. But but uh, but yeah, I was listening to one with Fabian Wagner this morning, and you know, there's a lot of these good things, yeah. and they're a good resource. I you know, I hope people, someone out there, a film student or whoever, you know, gets something from this, because anyway. I mean, it wasn't something that, you know, when we were coming up, there wasn't that resource of, you know, there was interviews and magazine stuff, but it wasn't the same thing. Uh, so it's cool to put a voice to a name and, and to yeah. experience it for a bit, um, and I. You know, I listen to a ton of interview shows with actors and people, you know, of all different shapes and sizes. It's a cool experience to listen to other people just talk about their experience. So yeah, I'm yeah. all about it. Um, and it did well for Patrick. So it did well for Patrick O'Sullivan. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think I think I, you know, and I listen to a lot of other podcasts myself, like, you know, cinematography and on cinematography. Do you know what I mean? Like ones. And, you know, I think a lot of the people it did do like it didn't do bad things for their career do you know what i mean i think yeah it's a good way to get yourself out there and 
for both sides of the of the story. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it's good just to have people hear you and, you know, because you, you can look at someone's Instagram and, you know, you can't, like, it's tough to make a judgment on who that person is or what they're like. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I think, um, you know, none of us have the same story, you no. know, especially internationally. It's very different rule, you know, different upbringings, different, you know, I know Steven's a bit older, for instance. Yeah. You know, like his timetable is probably different and, you know, I think it's uh, it's fascinating how we all end up in the same job, but the, you know, how we got there was markedly different. So, yeah. um, well, cool, man. This has been great. I, mean, I, I really enjoyed really, really it. Uh, it's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you, man. I'm, I'm happy you're in good spirits and yeah. healthy, and you're you know get the family stuff. Thanks yeah. so much for coming on. It's been uh, it's been really good, and like I think we've we've covered a lot of stuff. And obviously, there was like loads more that we could have gone into, but yeah, certainly, yeah. Um, yeah. But it was great, man. I appreciate you having me on, man. Good to see you, Joe. No, no, man. All right. Well, I'll uh, hopefully speak soon. Yeah, let's do it. Have a good one. Cheers, man.